All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Today, we are happy to have everyone here to discuss. Um, we're group two of the Sex and Resistance GC2Y. Uh, we're here to discuss gender norms and how they impact people's lives in different ways. Um, our speaker for today is the lovely Dr. Sarah Dude. Dr. Dude is a professor of criminal justice as well as um, the criminal justice coordinator for George College. Today, she's going to speak to you about her and her family's experience with gender norms growing up. Now I'm going to pass over the floor to Dr. Dude to have her speak to you. The floor is yours. Okay, hey everybody, I'm Sarah Dowd and I'm from Middle Tennessee and I teach criminal justice at Georgia College and have for 15 years. Um, I do do research on LGBTQ issues as far as like um, victimization and fear of victimization. But for this topic, I just want to talk about my personal experience. Um, when um, I was born uh, in 1978 <laughs> uh, in Middle Tennessee, um, and it's not the bumping metropolis that you would think it would be. Um, <laughs> and my little sister was born in 1980. And so we're about um, 18 months apart or something like that. Um, but um, when Jennifer was born, everybody knew something was different about her. Um, and... I talked to her before to make sure that my own experiences were right, but everybody knew something was different. And I didn't, I didn't really pick that up until much older um, because she was just my sister. She was my person. Uh, she was my playmate, you know, <laughs> um, it was me and her. Um, so uh, we started going to a babysitter, uh, like a meemaw situation, not like a, not like a daycare, but, uh, they called her bull, um, at that daycare. And it was part of her personality, like being gruff and all that stuff. And she was overweight. And, um, as we, I didn't recognize that as bullying until much later, but as we grew up together, um, I remember just being on, um, being, just playing bank or something, and her telling me she wishes she was a boy, um, and like four or five, and uh, she just wished she was a boy. And um, that didn't really change anything for that moment, other than I think she just wanted to tell me that. Um, other people were starting to notice that she had like more masculine features. She was more dominant. And then also she started to show uh, signs of developmental disabilities. So you have, in a way, a double, um, a double, um, lack of privilege. Um, so she's got disabilities and, um, also she had, she, I mean, she's gender non-binary. Um, and so throughout our childhood, a lot of my life was policing Jennifer, um, trying to get her to wear right clothes. Right. Um, trying to get her to grow her hair out. My mom kept both of our hairs short so she didn't have to fix it. Um, and we were both called boys sometimes, but Jennifer especially. And so um, I remember um, there was another overweight little girl who who. I knew oh, when she was older and she said, whenever I'd have to give my clothes to your sister, I would be so mad because I was giving my clothes to a boy. Um, and so we went, we grew up in an area where um, you, 
he went to school with people from, um, you know, preschool all the way to 12th grade. So, and it was a small town and my parents were attorneys there. So we were like well-known little kids. We got off the bus in the little on the little main street and hung out in the little town, and everybody knew Jennifer. And we were mostly, um, mostly. I mean, we were well liked, the little kids, and um, most everybody just accepted Jennifer for what she was. Um, some of the hardest things we went through were being out of town or being in other social situations. Um, some of the things that I would say about her is um, when we go out to eat, for my whole life, she had asked me to go to the bathroom with her. And it was because um, once we went to the bathroom together, she felt like I could be her defense. Um, because there were older women that would be like, why is there a boy in here and want to fight with me as a, a little kid, too, about if Jennifer was a boy or not. And I didn't even realize how much that impacted my life until I went to a restaurant in Atlanta like two years ago. And Jennifer said, Will you go to the bathroom with me? And uh, we go to the bathroom. And she was like, oh, good. It, it doesn't have a gender. It's a gender neutral bathroom. And it just made me cry because I didn't. I was so socialized into doing that with her. that She finally got the freedom to go to the bathroom in peace. Um, and so that was some of the, um, like I'm still realizing things that, things that happened to us that I did only, I only know happened to us because of Jennifer. Um, and there were times, of course, through growing up, um, people making fun of her, um, for both her developmental delays and her um her be dressing like a little boy um i would sometimes i feel really guilty about this get her to try to go by boy pronouns and um <laughs> just be like just go by joe jennifer come on like just don't embarrass me is basically you know, and uh, one of the things that would happen a lot when we would go out to eat, servers would be like, sir, what do you want? You know, and uh, my mom would always get defensive about it and be so mean. She'd be like, she is a she. But Jennifer could give a shit less. That's the thing. Um, and I don't know if it was the community we grew up in, there was a large, big part of acceptance of that's just the way Jennifer is. Or if, um, or if, you know, her developmental disabilities played into that. Um, and so when I talked to her before I wanted to, um, wanted to come on here I asked her about some of these questions I mean I know the answers but I want to hear them from her but a large part of my life was defending her um through the well probably still now where I grew where we grew up if you were perceived as gay that was social suicide. Um, you didn't have friends. Um, you um, were made fun of, bullied. Um, there are people beat up, all those things. Um, but Jennifer got to go to a different school. She got to go to a school just for people with developmental delays. So 
um, she got to stay in a smaller group, and I think they were nicer to her than where we went to, where I went to school. Um, and of course, little kids are mean. You know, uh, when me and her started riding the bus, it was something every day, every day. And uh, it, she told me tonight that really it never really bothered her that I'm the one <laughs> that it really hurt. Um, and that's the hardest part, you know, like I'm hurting for her feelings that aren't being hurt. <laughs> weird I don't know um but some of the things I wanted to talk about like um as far as what it means for my family I have three sisters Jennifer being the youngest one and uh, my older two sisters are um they're much older than me like nine and ten years older or nine and 11 years older, and they um, told us what to do because <laughs> they're our older sisters. And they would get mad at Jennifer for um, various reasons. You know, they tried to get her to dress in girl clothes. Everybody tried everything. And then at some point, everybody just acquiesced. Like, at some point it became who cares. Um, and um, when we were talking today, she, I was like, Jiffer. Well, <laughs> I wish y'all could meet her. Jiffer, um, why do you wear boy clothes? And she was like, because they're more comfortable. Um, good point. She seems like a pragmatist in all of this stuff I asked her. But um, how it impacted my life is that, well, first of all, I had to deal with people making fun of her for developmental disability. Secondly, I, I had to deal with people making fun of her because she was gay or dressed like a boy, whatever. And um, so I'm particularly sensitive about how um how I handled those times if I handled them correctly um and how sometimes I would get resentful at her for putting me through these things um those are really complicated feelings right there and there are times I was mean to her very hard feelings because I know I didn't help with I didn't make her life easier I would say um and our family is grossly impacted not gross it's hugely impacted by Jennifer in the sense that Anytime I had to bring somebody home or date or whatever, there's a whole big explanation I have to do about who Jennifer is, um, what she looks like. You're going to argue with me about her gender. That's happened before. Um, and she is just what she is. Um, and so this has also come up with situations where um, we have six nieces and nephews and two great nieces. And right now we have a great niece who's four and she is very confused about Jennifer's gender identity. Um, and all of our nieces and nephews had to make it through that little age group of, I think it's two to four, and then even older, about like identifying gender and um, patterns of clothing, cars, all that stuff. Um, 
and our every niece and nephew at <laughs> once they get through and try to figure Jennifer out, they're like, there's just no way you can explain her. Um, like, they'll say, you know, like, they learned a, some of the same lessons that I learned about having to defend her. Um, they've had to go through that too. That's my aunt, blah, blah, blah. I, we love her how she is, you know. Um, and uh, in, uh, in a way, I honestly believe that helped me be more open to acceptance of people. Um, acceptance of outsiders. Um, that That's the biggest thing. And I think my nieces and nephews will say the same thing is being part of somebody's family who has an outsider, visible outsider, um, that they learned tolerance of of, you know, different people and come to the defense of people that are different than them because of Jennifer. Um, so um, <laughs> here's some good stuff she needed me to tell you all about. Okay, y'all ready? First of all, she is always wanted to be a boy since she was little, very little. I remember that. Um, um, when somebody asked her if she is this or that or girl or boy, it doesn't hurt her. She is 40 years old and this is who she is. That's what she said. Um, when people call her sir, it doesn't bother her. Um, I asked her if she ever really considered um, trans, uh, transforming into a boy. And she said she thought about sex changes in high school, but um, she's, <laughs> this is how funny she is. She's had so many surgeries, she just would hate to put her body through another surgery. <laughs> that was her reason. Um, she thought about sex changes in high school, but it just wasn't worth it. She wasn't going, um, once again, to do another surgery. And she is just Jennifer. Um, and then here's what she said about sexuality. Um, she says she's lesbian. Um, she don't act on it. <laughs> That's what she told me. Um, but she doesn't go around and broadcast her sexuality either. So um, that's my Jen Jen. Um, <laughs> there's a lot. Um, when I was told her I was doing this talk about her, she said, <laughs> Here's a quote for y'all. When you put your heart and soul in it, then you should be fine. Um, and she said, that when I'm talking about her, that I know what happened. <laughs> and um, she knows I'll always have her back. Um, There's nobody in this world I would have rather grown up with. So <laughs> I think that's everything I covered. Do you all have questions? Um, do you guys want to move on to the discussion questions that we have first and then open it up the floor to everyone else? Yeah. yeah. Let's do that. Cool. Well, we already addressed the first one. Um, on how your sister impacted, what do you think is like the biggest impact your sister had on your life? Yeah, 
empathy. Plain old empathy. Okay, and for your next one, uh, what's a tip to you would give to Georgia College students that may be going through the same thing? Well, some of the scariest times for Jennifer was she went to, she actually moved out of our house at one point and went to a community, like a tech school or community college. And um, some of the scariest parts for her were not finding people like her. She's always felt that loneliness. And the hardest part about college is finding your people. And when I was in college in 1996, there was a brand new Lambda Club, and it was LGBTQ Club, and people would sneak into the meetings. Once again, it was awful to be gay or even associated with gay <laughs> clubs. And when I came to Georgia College and they had a whole club and people were out there doing Bobcat Marketplace and being open, um, I felt my heart warm because I would have wanted that when I was in, um, when I was in college. Um, so really I would say trying to find um, social support because Jennifer went from no social support or social had plenty of social support and love and then moved to another area and um, didn't have as much contact with us and I know that was hurtful. Okay. Um... When in your life did you realize the seriousness and fully understand the impact that social norms or gender norms have? I say this in class. Um, I remember when I figured out now, don't take this like any wrong way, but I remember when I figured out that I was not pretty. I was, <laughs> I was five and there was a blonde headed little girl in Sam's club with me. And I looked at her and was like, you're so pretty. And I figured out that the gender norms of pretty were blonde. And I knew I was brown um, hair, right? And so the, uh, just that little thing moving in through my whole life as a female has always impacted me. And it made me realize like how much gender norms or you know, beauty norms, all those things can impact people because I was five years old. I was five years old. Um, and so um, the seriousness of fulfilling a gender role um, is very, very serious when it comes to, you know, physical attack. And uh, Jennifer has been physically attacked um, for her disability or for her not fitting a gender norm. I don't know. Was okay. That, uh, did that answer that? Yes, ma'am. Um, for the next question, it is. Has gender norms affected your teaching ability and method in the classroom? Well, first of all, I teach about gender norms. Um, <laughs> I teach a lot about gender norms and how it plays into violence. Um, 
both domestic violence, um, sexual assault. Um, yes, it definitely impacts how um, I teach um, because I am a feminist criminologist. And so gender is a big part of um, crime. <laughs> And the biggest predictor of crime is gender, right? Males being the most incarcerated and most arrested. And so a lot of people say race is the most important predictor, but no, it's gender. Um, so gender norms impact so much of our lives and our relation, every relationship. Um, and the idea that you could uh, be killed for just what it is you are because someone doesn't understand. That's the, you know, that's the seriousness of the serious. Um, Okay, I think I answered that. Um, all right, the next one is, do you think that the way a person is raised can affect their gender identity? Yes. Yes, my family is very open, um, very accepting. Um, there was, like I said, some trying to change Jennifer, but for the most part, once she decided that, that's who she's been since. Uh, the last time she wore a dress was at my wedding 15 years ago. So um, that's, um, I think the openness of our family and our family being uh, progressive in a small town and everybody liking my family helped a lot with the acceptance of Jennifer. I think if Jennifer um, was right, sorry. I think if Jennifer was raised in a more religious and strict household, she would have been stifled to an extent that she would be depressed and have probably more mental problems than she does with us. Right. Um, we actually got a question from Dr. Um, S about um, if you could elaborate more on just for a minute on some of the insights of your research and like what you study, because I know that um, we know from the research that we've done that you um, studied racial influences on criminal justice, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, just we, uh, Carrie Cook and I just did a paper that just got accepted about LGBTQ victimization and fear of victimization. Um, I just did the edits for that paper and it will be in Victims and Offenders. Um, and essentially what we found was that a lot of fear of crime in general is contingent um, on your fear of sexual assault. Um, it's called the shadow effect. So when we ask you, uh, do you fear crime? And then when you break it down to property, personal, um, or violent, um, it turns out that a lot of people are scared of crime, but really specifically, it's a specific type of crime. Uh, for women, it's rape. Um, and for men, I think it's just general assault. Um, and sorry. And how that plays out into fear um, and uh, 
sexuality is really interesting because of the different experiences, right? If you're constantly being called slurs and whatnot, um, that may not hurt as bad, or you may expect people to treat you that way. And so the fear isn't as great. Um, I use this example in uh, I use this example in uh, criminology with uh, women. Women are scared to death of rape. There's been surveys say, you know, like it fill in the blank for women who hadn't been raped, they feel like they would die and or kill themselves. Whereas women who have been raped made it through and say it's something you can make it through it's not the worst people make women make it through that right so my fear of rape has subsided because that experience has happened to me does that make sense i'm so sorry it's all good. Yes, ma'am, that does make sense. Um, the next question we actually have for you is, um, why do you think that like obviously incorrect gender stereotypes are still expressed within society today? Will you repeat that? I'm so sorry. Of course, no worries. Um, why do you think obviously incorrect gender stereotypes are still expressed within society today? I think it's like just easy. It's the easiest way to identify other people. And all of us like to categorize people. It's almost natural, almost. Um, so gender stereotypes, at I think gender stereotypes for me, I've noticed they get all tied up in questions of sexuality and sometimes sexuality and gender stereotypes don't match. <laughs> um, as in, you know, you can have very masculine gay men. Um, however, nobody imagines really the very feminine lesbian. Um, uh, well, to some extent. Did that answer the question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right, so the next one we have for you is, uh, why do you think it is more socially tolerated that females act more masculine than when men act more feminine? That is the hardest question on there. To me, I don't know how to explain that other than kind of it's always been that way, <laughs> right? Um, Would you say that uh, uh, men are held to more of a standard than females are? In terms yes. Of switching over? Okay. Yeah, that's what I would say, that men are held to because, like, you know, machismo's there, all those things. So um, the perception of a feminine man, um, I mean, even the feminization of certain jobs, um, um, ha we're, we have a hard time, right? With male nurses, um, male teachers, um, K through 12. Uh, some of those things, it's still a girl job. And by that, they mean uh, lower wages. Uh, when men enter the pink collar jobs, the wages go up. Right. So uh, I think there's a big impact on uh, the male stereotype of being tough and all those things. And I think through the past 20 years, those stereotypes are starting to go away um, slowly and surely um, with 
little things like men getting access to makeup or uh, <laughs> uh, my husband wearing my pants, right? Uh, stuff like that. Um, so every, I feel like it's just, that's just a slow process. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I agree with what you said about how um, it's becoming more normal now because not even though it's becoming more normal, there's more male nurses wanted and needed all across the country. So, Right, and that's a reflection of changes in gender norms. Um, when my mom went to school in 19... 19- <laughs> she supported my dad through law school. She got an actual MRS degree, like a piece of paper from the law school that said, Lena Buck, here's an MRS degree. And uh, she wasn't pushed to go to law school. She had to go to law school when she was 50 and have four kids, <laughs> right? So... There's a lot to um, women's rights in pushing some of those issues. Okay. Do you think that media has a big impact on gender norms that we have in the United States? Oh, yeah, totally. Totally. Uh, Boy George, y'all go look him up. we just slowly inched through um, the media's way of acceptance of certain gender norms. You can go through rock and roll and see it, right? Okay. Um, you have um, the queen guy, Freddie Mercury, right? He was accepted. He changed gender norms. Then also you have um, David Bowie. He flipped some gender norms. Prince. Prince flipped a lot of gender norms. And now you have um, like that little Nas X fella. You have all of those musicians, though, open the way of um, like transgressive gendering. Um, and honestly, I think I relate (laughs) probably way too much to print because that is so intriguing just to go out and be who you are and let the world just go on its way and not care, um, and you could see that that was gender norms being, um, you know, twisted around in in uh, in music, but also you have TV where gender norms are prop uh, are propped up and propagated. You know, um, I'm a big fan of The Simpsons, and Marge is that wife. <laughs> you know, Marge is the stay at home woman who takes, and I appreciate that. Um, and at the same time, I appreciate that um, that we all have the right to express whatever it is we are because of some of those changes. All right. And the uh, final question is, do you think that there's any way that gender norms have been beneficial to today's society? I have no clue. (laughs) I don't know. They help us organize stuff. I mean, how are they beneficial? Well, there's lots of stuff I like that's feminine. Well, I mean, do you think they are (laughs) beneficial? I'm not sure, but I don't know what the alternative is. You know, we do like to classify people. That 
your gender is the first thing people know about you your parents <laughs> included right everything is divided down by gender for a long time in your life and um a lot of times not a positive thing sometimes it can be a positive thing but it's the one thing sexism is much more accepted to some extent because of gender roles it's sexism is part of one gender role does that make sense yeah. um and it's way more obvious to me than like say racism uh to, I mean, as far, well, I'm a white woman too, of course, but um, I can take some hits. I take much more sexist hits than I hear other people um, making racist hits, you know, um, but to call somebody a sexist doesn't hurt as bad for a white person as it does as um, calling somebody a sexist. Nobody, nobody's going to cry or have their feelings hurt that much. Um, I don't know. You know all this. I'm just speaking from my head, right? This is not to be written yeah. down. Okay, okay. <laughs> and I, I, I think next we were going to let anybody, if they have any questions, they can ask them in the chat for you or just related to this? Y'all can speak out or y'all can type in the chat. Yeah, so or up to y'all. I see some of my students in here. Really no questions. This is a time you get to ask me anything. Well, not anything. Um, I have a quick question. Um, so with your sister, did you um, like notice a change in like her confidence in her sexuality and like individuality as she got older and started to like accept more about who she was? Like, did you notice like her get more confident as she grew up or was she always pretty much just like the same confidence if I don't care, <laughs> that's, that's who I am. I think really honestly, like the most confidence I've seen in her is since some of the gay rights movement. Um, she just <laughs> blurted out to my aunts who are all church of Christ that she was lesbian and that's just who she was. I, I really think like some of the social movement to push her into a place where she will share it. Um, but uh, she had always had a lot of confidence in who she is um, from the time we were little. Um, and I think that's helped her in this situation. Why some of these things don't hurt her when they did hurt me. Did that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. You're welcome. With your nieces and nephews, do you see like the real time like social learning of gender norms as they like spend more time in school? Yuppers. <laughs> uh, the four year old right now she is all into Barbies and stuff, and it confuses her as to why Jennifer doesn't wear a bra like her mom. Um, how is Jennifer a girl if she does XX and X? Um, so right now, the four-year-old's like, she's just in her pre-K. And um, she's a very prissy little girl. And so Jennifer is one of the main people she hangs out with. And you can watch her try to figure out gender norms. Um, 
as far as her being very feminine and then Jennifer being a girl who looks like a boy. Um, and I know that can be confusing, but you have to have somebody there to talk through it with who will be honest. Well, if uh, no one has any other questions, we just want to say thank you so much for speaking at our event today. And we loved hearing your firsthand experience. Thank you. She's a person who always has my heart. <laughs> thank you for coming. Even yes. if she gets on my nerves. <laughs> no, I'm glad yeah, to be thank here. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here and I'm glad to be asked. I love talking about her. And uh, she has a lot of, she's given me a lot of patience and uh, given me lots and lots of things to think about <laughs> um, through my whole life. And she's, she is, like I said, who she is. And that's one of the most beautiful parts of my sister. She is boldly who she is. <laughs> so um, anyway, I really appreciate you asking me to talk. And I hope um, y'all got some perspective on what it's like uh, to grow up with somebody who doesn't, um, who has, you know, uh, who's gender non-binary and then also has intellectual disabilities, which makes it even more complicated. Um, anyway, thank you. And thank you to my students who came. I see all y'all out there.